Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good evening. Mr. Speaker, it's indeed a pleasure to stand here before this noble house representing the government of Guyana in the presentation of our 2024 national budget. Mr. Speaker, before I begin, allow me to humbly thank my dear colleague, the Minister responsible for finance and his capable team for once again delivering on the promises made by the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration, which we have made our commitments prior to taking office in 2020, and this is the journey. And this journey, Mr. Speaker, requires us to stay on the course, building prosperity for all. Now, Mr. Speaker, might I remind this House that the People's Progressive Party civic government is a pro-poor political party. We have never removed from our core objective being people-focused, people-centered, and having a government that is directed by the people. I recall the former honorable member, Sidney Ryan, mentioning that we forgot that we were in office for 23 years. No, we did not forget. We remember clearly because when we took office in 1992, this was a bankrupt economy, a highly indebted and poor economy. Successive administrations under this People's Progressive Party Civic moved this economy from a highly indebted and poor economy to a middle-income economy when we left office in 2015. So those kids who were around during 1992 were able to benefit and see the growth and development from this economy. So when we, re when we returned to office, Mr. Speaker, in 2020, we were here to continue the progress, to continue the progress of a political party that understands governance, that understands development, that understands how to move the central pillars within the economy, that being the social, economic and political. Well, Mr. Speaker, before I go into describing and explaining how we connect the economy with our foreign policy objectives, because I think it's important for us to link the President's mandate and our foreign policy objectives to what we do here at home in Guyana, and to show the people of Guyana that nexus, that connection between a strong and robust economy and the advancement and the promotion of our foreign policy agenda. So, Mr. Speaker, it is incumbent upon me to give regards to the President, the Prime Minister, the Vice President, the entire Cabinet and MPs for the leadership and representation that we've provided to the people of this country over the last three years. Well, Mr. Speaker, I dare say that the representation on this side reflects the plural nature of this society. It is, it is, of course, Mr. Speaker, a true representation of the diversity of this beautiful country we call Guyana. And that is why we were proud to present the list to the people of this country prior to taking office, which they accepted, supported, 
And that is why we're here presenting the 2024 budget, which the people have mandated and which we are proud on delivering for them. Mr. Speaker, it is also important for me to, to link all of our objectives here to the, to the global positioning and the global priorities, that being the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. So that everything that we do here within the ministries, and you would have heard from the ministers who would have spoken before me, labor, education, local government, public, public works, you would see, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, that for us in the People's Progressive Party, Civic, as, an as a government, that we believe in ensuring that we have a strong and robust economy. That helps us to advance our foreign policy objectives. I want to make that connection. So, Mr. Speaker, for example, let's take the social pillar. Dealing with social services, government services being provided to communities such as education and health care. $135.2 billion being awarded to the Ministry of Education. So this is squarely in line, Mr. Mr. Speaker, with the Sustainable Development Goals number four. Connecting directly to the global priorities. So the people of Ghana can understand why education is a priority for us. It's not a priority for us only because it's a national objective. It is a global priority. And this helps us in ensuring, Mr. Speaker, that we don't not only have educated people, but, it's more, but more importantly, to have an educated labor market. The President spoke on several occasions about having a sophisticated and educated labor force to support the diversity and the growth that we are and the trajectory, the growth trajectory of this country. So the advancement in the education sector, talking about University of Guyana, the Gold Program, the TIFET program, dealing with treating with uh, treating with uh, treating with the because we care cash grant, improving the learning experience, all are part and parcel of ensuring that we prepare for a advanced labor market. Now, Mr. Speaker, we have to build out this economy very fast. And in some cases, we have to do some leapfrogging. And when members on the other side complain about spending money in the goal, we have to. It's, it's, it's logical. It's a practical initiative. Because we need more people to be trained in a faster manner. That is why we have said, based on consultations, that we needed to train 20,000 persons within the next five years. And we write on course to ensure that we can provide the training. So this year, we're going to train 6,000 additional or new students with the, currently, with the current batch of 3,967. So Mr. Speaker, ensuring that we have an indicated workforce that is diversified to cater for all of the sectors, are important for us, and that is why I want to commend my colleague, Minister Responsible for Education, who is on a break, for the valiant work that she's been doing, and working hard to ensure that we can have an educated workforce that supports my colleague, Minister of Labor. Mr. Speaker, Let us touch on health care. On the health care, we have $129.8 billion budgeted for 2024. Fitting squarely within the SDGs number three, with Sustainable Development Goals number three, for good health and well-being. And we're staying the course, Mr. Speaker. We want to have also a healthy labor force, which would also, which would also improve productivity, life expectancy, life expectancy, sorry, 
improving our human development index, which would also provide for our happiness. As the president mentioned also, we need to have a happy population. Having a population that is healthy and educated improves the well-being, improves the standard of living and quality of life, and provides for a happy population. You can check out the happiness index. It's a real thing. Mr. Speaker, I know that my colleague minister will repeat this, but we continue to advance in building out a world-class healthcare system. So looking at the development of the, of the seven region, six regional hospitals in Bath, Bikendron, Diamond, and Mole, Lima, number 75 village, added to the upgraded hospitals in Bartica, Sunny, West Demarara, Lethem, all speaks to ensuring that we maintain that healthy environment where our population can have quality health care, not only here on the coastline, but within the communities across the 10 regions and three counties of Guyana. Mr. Speaker, if we look at the social health care, social welfare, sorry, we have $48.3 billion budgeted for the welfare program, which speaks to protecting citizens from economic risks and insecurities in their lives. This is Sustainable Development Goal number 10, Mr. Speaker. So we have increased the old age pension from 33,000 to 36,000 per month, placing an additional 2.7 billion disposable income in the hands of 76 76,000 pensioners, which reflects a 75% increase in the old age pension since the PPPC resumed office in 2020. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, the NIS monthly would be now $43,075, which results in 2.6 billion an additional disposable income to benefit over 27,000 persons. We also have an increase of $3,000, from $16,000 to $19,000 a month for public assistance. Mr. Speaker, we're not leaving anyone behind. As we have mentioned time and time again, that everyone will be included in ensuring that they benefit from the growth and balanced development from this government. Everyone is included. We are providing for everyone. And that is why the social pillar is very important in helping us at the Foreign Ministry, Mr. Mr. Speaker, because we want to be able to have people who are living longer, who are educated, so that we can attract the foreign investment that we so desire, so that we can ensure that we're providing for the human development and human capital to be able to advance this economy. Mr. Speaker, we cannot do it, do it without the people of this country. And the people of, the country, of this country has given the People's Progressive Civic Party in administration, in government, the mandate, the mandate to deliver on the promises. Mr. Speaker, allow me to Allow me to go to the economic pillar. And this is Sustainable Development Goals number nine. Infrastructure, innovation, and industry. Mr. Speaker, the overall GDP of this country is expected to grow by 4.3% in 2024. The fastest growing economy in the world. And I know that my colleagues on the other side, Mr. Speaker, will know that when we took office in 1992, we were one of the poorest economies in this region, second to Haiti. 
Now we are admired by the rest of the world for the leadership that we have provided between 1992 to 2015 and since we took office in 2020. Mr. Speaker, when we talk about infrastructure and we look at the connectivity, ensuring that we connect northern Brazil with the Atlantic, connecting the three counties, east to west, ensuring that we have the right infrastructure in place, which will improve productivity, Mr. Speaker, efficiency, which will lead to our improved competitiveness. And we cannot do without infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. So when we are speaking on the international stage, and we're talking about Guyana, and the progress that Guyana is making, we are able to sell Guyana and to position Guyana in the global environment where we can attract the kinds of investment needed to be able to, that will be able to build this country out because we cannot do it alone. We have to do it with our friends, with our partners, and we have to have an economy that we can actually present to the people of this world. Mr. Speaker, to note, to note, the government has allocated 19.7 billion to advance the construction of the new Demerara River Bridge, and also 4.2 billion to commence the construction of the new Wismar River Bridge. This is connectivity, Mr. Speaker. In between that, if, if you look at connecting Linden to Latham, four to five concrete bridges will be constructed. And that is very important, Mr. Speaker, because we understand that if we're going to connect the Guyana Shield, and if we're going to be able to position Guyana, we have to be able to build out our infrastructure. We have to be able to drive efficiency. That's reduced costs right there. That's making our country more competitive. And we have to be competitive to be able to advance our foreign policy agenda. Mr. Speaker, Allow me to allow me to also highlight the fact that we are also focused on ensure that we give particular attention to drainage and irrigation. As you know, Mr. Speaker, we are low-lying coastal land, and we have to ensure that we can build resilience that we can build resilience by ensuring that we can keep our northern border safe and protected. So $72.3 billion budgeted for upgrade and maintenance of the National Drainage and Irrigation Network in 2024 will see us investing in new pump stations, will see us ensuring that we can be able to build resilience to climate change due to high sea level rise and that, I must commend my colleague, Minister of Agriculture, his responsibility over the years for protecting us and, and giving the people of Guyana the surety that we can be protected at the northern end of this country, which is with the Atlantic. Mr. Speaker, briefly on sea defense also, we're treating with $6.9 billion in this budget. These are all well thought out numbers that are able to be put together so that we can ensure that we deliver for the people. This is part and parcel of our security. Mr. Speaker, allow me to also speak on industry and commerce sector. My colleague, Onesh Waldron, who is responsible for this sector, who's been doing an outstanding job in promoting small business in Guyana. And small business is dominant in ensuring that we can have employment, creativity, and innovation, which is also Sustainable Development Goals number nine, Mr. Speaker, connecting Guyana with the rest of the world. Mr. Speaker, 
The People's Progressive Civic Administration continues to recognize the integral role of small businesses in improving livelihoods and employment in this economy. In this regard, the government has allocated $450 million for the replenishment of Small Business Development Fund, which is very vital, Mr. Speaker. Our administration has also allocated $331 million to the Small Business Bureau for initiatives that will continue for the small to grow the small and micro business development and the promotion of entrepreneurship to address the structural changes, promote business development and cultivating entrepreneurship behavior to strengthen business cooperation. One of the things I want to note, Mr. Speaker, when you observe the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration, we have been dismantling structural barriers from the time we took office in 1992. We have been removing barriers. We have been creating equality, equal opportunities, equity, and ensuring that there's fairness in this economy. So the structurally violent economy that we have inherited in 1992, we moved swiftly to dismantle those structures, to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity in this country. And that is why you can have fantastic grades coming from Region 5, Region 6, Region 3, the hinterland. We've done that with education. We've done that with health care to ensure that everyone can get quality health care all across this country. We've done that with the small business, to ensuring that everyone across this country, once they are qualified, that they will have a stimulus to ensure that they can thrive and grow their small business. That is the nature of this country, of this, of this government. Mr. Speaker, I can also float agriculture. But I will leave that, I will leave that for my, my colleague to deal with. But I needed to talk about it a little bit. Because that 97.6 billion is part of the diversification of this economy. And we've heard time and time again, Mr. Speaker, that the President and the Cabinet, whether we are in Georgetown or, where we, or whether we are in communities, we always remain focused on the diversification of this economy and not being susceptible to the resource course. And that is why we have focused a lot of our attention on the non-oil economy, ensuring that we can diversify this economy using the support that we've provided to the other two pillars to ensure that we can have an economy that is fit for purpose, that is innovative, creative, and competitive, ensuring that we can survive oil, because oil is a finite product. Mr. Speaker, the fisheries sector is expected to grow and $1.2 billion was budgeted for fisheries, aquaculture, and development initiatives. In the forestry sector, we expect a record growth of 3.9%. And this aligns with SDG the Sustainable Development Goal number 12, where we speak about responsible consumption and production. Mr. Speaker, the extractive sector is also expected to grow by 43.6%. The gold and bauxite mining subsectors are expected to grow this year by 15.7%. And 57.2 percent, respectively. So there you have it, Mr. Speaker. We have an economy that is growing progressively. We have an economy, an economy that is benefiting from balanced development. We have an economy that is ready for 2030 and beyond. We are on the right course. And we're staying the course, Mr. Speaker. 
The numbers don't lie. We can go all the way back to 1992 and we can crunch the numbers. And we have showed steady progression. We have showed that we are capable of leading this nation, not only here in the region, but to provide global leadership. Mr. Speaker, allow me to speak a little bit about the political pillar. And I know that this is quite interesting to the people of Guyana because they know that our political system is stable and progressive because of their participation, because they are able to elect their representatives and they are able to ensure that this country remains a democratic country where people's rights and privileges are, are maintained, where there's rule for law, where there's good governance. Look at our country brand, Mr. Speaker. Our, the brand of this country has improved exponentially since we returned to office in 2020. Our national brand has improved. The people are prouder to be Guyanese. We are well respected now. It is because we are able to nurture a political system driven by the people. Not what we had to survive during the 28 years of dictatorship, where it was directed by the state where there was party paramountcy. That doesn't exist now, Mr. Speaker. There's consultation, there's partnership, there's respect, led by the people. Their priorities are taken on board and respected. And we deliver on it. We know all too well, Mr. Speaker, that we're not going back to those days. Those individuals who witnessed, young people who witnessed, the 2020 elections saw so all too clearly, Mr. Speaker, the tragedy and agony that their parents and grandparents had to endure during the 28 years of dictatorship and five years of repression. Mr. Speaker, we are not going back. The reason why the president, the entire cabinet, and executives of this government can travel and be respected and, and listened to and admired because our political system is on the right course. And we're staying that course. We are staying that course. We will lead this country to another free and fair elections, free from fear. And we are going to return to continue the journey. So this budget, Mr. Speaker, is not, just only about, it's not only about numbers. It's about progress. It's about our commitment to service. It is about delivering on the promises that we've made. And we have to do that by using resources. This is what we're about, Mr. Speaker. They are more attracted to the numbers. Because when we left office in, 19, in 2015, we had over $800 million in the Consolidated Fund. You know what they did, Mr. Speaker? They spent it out. They took care of themselves and their families and their friends. The billions that we left in those agencies, they spent it all out. They never, they never delivered on that good life. We have always delivered. We continue to deliver. We continue to meet and exceed the expectations of the people of this country. And we'll continue to do it. We will continue to do it here in Guyana with the help of the people of this country because we've been elected to represent them. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the, 
in effort to strengthen and consolidate our bilateral ties with our neighbors and friendly countries, as well as multilateral organizations, we are working on preserving our sovereignty and territorial integrity to promote Guyana's trade and economic interests and enhance the image and presence of our country and people on the world stage. Mr. Speaker, His Excellency President Mohamed Irfan Ali has undertaken bilateral, regional and multilateral visits to advance our foreign policy agenda. Un honorable, which is sent honorable Minister, you will need an extension to country. I don't see why I have to shout over you. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask for my honorable member to be given a five minutes to conclude his discussion and to also express, sir, my utter disappointment that here was a speaker who was speaking on a national policy and trying to raise the debate in this parliament from the pits he's been in to a high level and all it led to was guffaws Thank you, and Minister. jokes. Honorable and I just Minister. want to go on record. Honorable Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Trade, you have five minutes to continue. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, so, Mr. Speaker, we would have seen the President would have undertaken several international visits. All carefully crafted, all ensured that we, the people, benefit. So, Mr. Speaker, what I wanted the people of Ghana to know and understand clearly is that every time the president leaves Guyana, we are bringing benefits to the people. And that is how we do it. We've built, and we are building a strong and resilient economy. We're able to travel and represent Guyana in the international forum on all of the issues and you would have seen us advancing our climate agenda our food agenda as well as our energy agenda energy agenda all national priorities that are also global priorities so mr speaker the president's visit to india united kingdom china qatar dominican republic Washington, D.C., are all visits that we have seen benefits. And Mr. Speaker, might I submit to this House that the, the visits of His Excellency the President representing Guyana in advancing our foreign policy, we've had for more than 40 MOUs, agreements, roadmaps all across the world from Ghana to the Kingdom of the Netherlands Trinidad and Tobago Saudi Arabia Rwanda Uzbekistan Tajikistan so Mr. Speaker when you think about the rewards in terms of our representation in the multilateral international, regional levels, we have been ensuring that we put the people of this country first. Mr. Speaker, since we took office, we have also undertaken 44 accreditations. And this is across the global environment. Republic of Angola, United Arab Emirates, the Swiss Confederation, Republic of Cyprus, Republic of Philippines, the Kingdom of Norway, the People's Republic, Democratic Republic of Algeria, Japan, just to name a few. So Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to give, give you the facts in terms of our representation, accreditation, which speaks to 
the number of countries that want to engage us, whether it's on the political dialogue, whether it's economic cooperation, whether it's people-people exchange, we have been very busy, Mr. Mr. Speaker, working with, in the interests of the people through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Mr. Speaker, briefly allow me to let me allow allow me to briefly, before I wrap up, speak to our programs. Mr. Speaker, we have three programs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. The first program speaks to the first program speaks to the development of our foreign policy agenda. And that, Mr. Speaker, speaks to institutional strengthening of our processes, procedures. We've trained eight or nine, we've trained 93% of our foreign service officers in with eight or nine programs so far. And we want to continue that trend for this year. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Argyle Declaration, of course, ensuring that we are able to maintain the course with the case that we have before the ICJ. And Mr. Speaker, you know, will know that that has been very inclusive. We have on board Mr. Carl Greenidge, who is the agent, former foreign minister, former foreign secretary, Mr. Van West Charles, who is now the ambassador um, to Guyana in Venezuela. We also have Ambassador Ronald Austin, who is part of the legal team, um, who, who is on the legal team. We also have Honorable Member Desir Walton, who is a member of the advisory committee. So we have remained inclusive when it comes to the national issue. So our representation with regards to the case before the ICJ is very inclusive. We re it remains intact, and we're proud to display to the people of this country and the rest of the world that the People's Progressive Party Civic is a truly inclusive government, a bipartisan arrangement that speaks to our maturity and our commitment to the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, bef before I close, let me say that we are on the right track. When you think about all of the ministries, the locations, and the projects that we have to roll out for this year, allows us as a government to deliver on our promises, to remain focused, to stay the course, to ensure that we bring wealth and prosperity to the people of this country, and to continue to ensure that their rights, privilege, and freedoms are respected. So Mr. Speaker, I commend the 2024 annual budget to this assembly for its unanimous approval. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister Todd.